I'm an addict named Sam. First of all, I want to thank God for allowing me to be here tonight. I want to thank God because I tried everything I could think of not to be here. I tried to kill myself. I tried to get you to kill me. I did not like me. And God, in God's goodness and mercy, kept me, I believe, the only reason to be here tonight or at any other NA meeting uh, in the world. I absolutely believe that as long as the ties that bind us together are stronger than those that could tear us apart, all will be well. I strongly believe that, and one of my greatest fears in our fellowship today, and I know it was addressed today in this convention, and I'm so glad it was, is the issue of diversity. Because unless and until we lay aside all those things that they say divide us, we cannot continue to grow and get better. And God has brought us, because this disease is no respecter of anything. He don't care whether you speak English, Spanish, Chinese, or whatever else. He doesn't care if you're white, blonde, red-headed, black, brown, yellow, or someplace in between. He don't care. He don't care if you got 14 degrees or you can't read. He don't care if you're fat or skinny. He wants you. It's a serious disease. And for that reason, I want tonight to just take a moment to greet my sisters and brothers who do speak Spanish to let them know our respect and our joy and our strength as they have come into our fellowship and made us look different and sound different. Entonces, yo quiero saludar a los hispan hispanohablantes, hermanas y hermanos, porque yo creo absolutamente, y es bastante verdadero, que siempre que los lazos que nos unan sean más fuertes, que aquellos que puedan separarnos, todo marchará bien. Entonces, yo les doy mi respeto, mis gracias, mi amor. Muchas gracias. I brought a rag with me tonight because I intend to sweat before I get off of this place. And I intend to sweat because when I fight with this disease, it takes all I got. It takes all you have. And I'm humbled. I'm so, this place is so sweet tonight. So beautiful tonight. I can't see because these lights are in my eyes. But when I was down there, I could see and I could hear that we came out of hell. We came out of a pit. We came out of misery pain, hate, self-hate, filth, dirt. God reached down and picked us up. And this place is so sweet tonight. As we hold hands, put our arms around one another, and look this beast in the face and dare him to raise his ugly head. We are going to beat him up, kick his ass, Tie them up, chain them down. We are not going to allow him to own us, not one more minute. And to the new addicts who came up here tonight, this thing works. This thing works. 
this beast can be put into jail. We can keep him locked up. But I know from my experience and all I got is my experience and strengths and hopes. That's all I got. I know from my experience that he never, ever dies. He waits. He can wait longer than I can fool myself into thinking that he at last is dead in my life. I know what I'm talking about. I've been there. He waited for me a long time. I need to tell you this, my clean date is June 17th, 1982. The first day I used was June 17th, 1961. I was sick a long time before I used. But I didn't know that. I was sick a long time after I laid down chemicals that changed the way I feel or my mood because I thought I got clean on my own. I didn't know. Why are we here tonight when I first heard this a long time ago brought me a freedom. After coming to N.A., we realized we were sick people. I did not know I was sick. I thought I was made wrong. I thought something was inside me twisted, perverted, and could never be straightened out. I thought I was doomed to die in misery. I was 50 years old when I found this program, or God led me to this program. I was 50 years old. I was 21 years old when I first picked up a drug. Let me tell you how I got here. I was working in the Maryland Penitentiary, 1961. First of all, I'm going to tell you this only to help identify who I am. I'm a priest. I'm the pastor of a parish today. And I tell you that because that kept me out of here for 25 years. Because I thought I could not tell my story and remain a priest. The shame and the guilt of what I had done and where I had been was so heavy. And I carried it every day, 24-7. Shame, guilt, fear, self-hate. And I stayed away from here and from you because I thought in my ignorance I was better than or had to be better than, could not tell the truth. And all I know today, I might be a priest, and as I go on tonight, I'm probably going to jump in and sound like a preacher, because I am a preacher, but I ain't came here to preach. I did not come here to teach. I came here simply to share with you my story. I came here to get real naked, and that's not pretty. <laughs> At one time, I thought I was pretty. I know today I ain't pretty. This thing going to get ugly because this disease is ugly. And what I found out, you got to expose the disease by telling the truth. All I can do is tell you where I've been, what I've seen, what I felt, what I feel tonight. And when I tell the truth, this beast lays down. And you know those speakers who spoke before me, and I was truly touched and enriched by the speakers I've heard in this convention, they kicked this beast down over these last two days. They knocked him down on the ground. They told the truth. 
and he's paralyzed. Our job tonight, not my job, our job tonight, come in this banquet hall, in this convention center, and tie this beast up, tie him up so tight that he can't move anymore. And then every one of us in here, I don't know how many there are, put our foot on his neck and say, motherfuckers, stay right where you are. You cannot get up. And we do that by telling the truth. We do that by telling the truth. Sometimes I know I use words I ain't supposed to use, but I got a disease I ain't supposed to have. And sometimes only those words describe what this thing has done to me. And so I'm going to tell the truth. Basic text tells me I stick in this basic text. I don't trust myself to wander away from it. Certain things followed as we continued to use in Who is an Addict. We became accustomed to a state of mind that is common to addicts. We forgot what it was like before we started using. We forgot about social grace. We acquired strange habits and mannerisms. We forgot how to work. We forgot how to play. We forgot how to express ourselves and how to show concern for others. We forgot how to feel. I never liked me. I never liked me. My earliest memory in life is trying to kill my baby brother when they brought him home. Because I thought they had a baby because something was wrong with me. I thought they had a baby to get rid of me. And so we were living in the projects in Harrison, New Jersey in 1941 when my brother was born. And the night my mother went into labor, an ambulance came to take her to the hospital. In those days, there are some women around here old enough to remember when you went to the hospital to have a baby, in 1941, you stayed there seven days. My mother was ill. The projects were across the street from a slaughterhouse. In 1941, they did not slaughter animals in secret. You did not go buy a chicken wrapped up in cellophane in a supermarket. You went and bought one that screamed and hollered when they cut his throat. And you pulled his feathers out of his body. And you pulled his guts out of, the, out of his body before you ate them. In those days, things were more out in the open. During World War II, those of you who are old enough to remember, they killed some of y'all, not just one, some of y'all old enough. Remember, during World War II, they used to kill horses for meat. In this slaughterhouse, they killed horses. The horses screamed when they died. The blood of the horses flowed out the back of the slaughterhouse. When my mother went into labor, she bled and she cried. I was two years old, it's my, and still it's my memory. When they came and took her away, I thought they came to do the same thing to her as they did to the horses. When she brought the baby home, I tried to put the baby, I didn't think about it, I tried to put the baby in the toilet. I did not know where toilets went. I did know that whatever went down the toilet did not come back again. <laughs> That's my earliest memory. Afraid that this baby came to take my place. Afraid that this baby was going to be the cause of my mother leaving me. My mother is 87 years old tonight. 
She lives. She's strong. She's bright. I cannot visit my mother more than three days, and I will be, if I live, till Christmas Eve, 64 years old. I cannot visit my mother for more than three days today without my belly flipping upside down, just like it did when I used to run. Without some kind of shame or guilt or something coming over me. I'm telling you that, I'm sharing that with you to tell you, I've been around here 21 years, but I'm still real sick. I'm still real scared. I'm still real frightened. I'm still real aware that this thing lives inside me. And I'm so glad you call this convention part of, part of, because I ain't never been part of nothing. Not my family, not my mother, not my church, not this nation, not a manhood, not humanity. I ain't never been part of nothing except NA. I have never felt home anywhere except in here. It's the only place in the world where I can get naked. I mean really naked. Because in this fellowship, Fig leaves don't work. That's right, in this fellowship, with this disease, if I hide any part of me, no matter how shameful it is, he gonna get me right in that part. I got diabetes today, I got it real bad. I wear an insulin pump to stay alive. As I'm talking to you, it's shooting insulin into my body to keep me here. Because I got this disease called diabetes, I break out in boils. I had two on my hand last week. I had three on my legs the week before. I had one on my belly the week before that. They painful, they fester, they hurt. The bacteria knows where to go in my body. It knows where there's a little scratch, a little cut, a little opening. It finds that opening and it runs there to feed on the sugar that's in my body. And it gets me down, except they got medicine that if I apply it properly, I can keep that thing under control. Same thing in here. This disease knows exactly where I'm hiding. And if I hide anywhere, anywhere, anything, he moves there and he grows there. And before I know it, he's festered and he's large and he's big and he's painful and he has me down in my own misery again. When I was four years old, carrying the memory of trying to kill my brother, I had a sister and she is pretty. And my father would come home from work. I do not come from a dysfunctional family. I was dysfunctional. They were functional. I didn't think I belonged. I don't know how I got this disease. I don't need to know how I got it. What I need to know is I have it. And that's why I need you. Because I sometimes forget I got this disease until you remind me, Sam, you are not Father Sam. You do not have 45 degrees in the air. You are not in charge of nothing. You don't sign checks, you're an addict, just like we are, and we call you Sam. But we all are the same in this room. Thank God we all the same. Thank God we found that out. Without you, I am doomed to die. I fed my sister kerosene mixed with Cairo syrup because she was pretty. And because my father said, she's a pretty little girl. And because Sam heard, my father never said this, Sam heard, if she's pretty, Sam is ugly. And if Sam is ugly, he can be traded in. So kill her. I don't know where I learned how to kill. They didn't have television in those times. We talk about the 1940s, ain't no television. We living in the project. There was a radio they played on Thursday night for two hours to save the electric. They played uh, uh, Lone Ranger and Amos and Andy, and then they shut it off. I don't know where I learned how to kill, but I knew if I fed her kerosene and I was 
I was probably six or seven. She was four. I tried to kill her. She drank that shit. She had to go to the hospital be pumped out. I'm a real sick individual. When I was 10 or 11 years old, I was always interested in the bizarre. Anything they said would hurt you. Anything they said was sick. Anything they said was perverted. Anything they said was inside out. Anything they said would send you into the pit of hell I was interested in. I still am. I still am. Only thing is here I've learned not to act out on what I think, that my thinking is sick. My best thinking got me in here. My best thinking got me at 64 to need to stand naked in front of you to give a, a newcomer and an old timer a shot of hope that this thing still works and we can hold this beast in, 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 a, in a prison cell somewhere. There was a Boy Scout troop and they were having an initiation. And it turned into a sexual thing, pull off your clothes, ba ba ba. In the basement of a church. And I liked it. I was fast, I heard that that's what happened. I couldn't wait for my turn. And I lived with that shame and that disgrace till I found the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous. I never could tell anybody. I used to say, I got abused. I ain't got abused. Maybe it's true because I was a kid. I was 11 or 12, but still in all, I knew what was happening. I liked the idea of it. I liked the, uh, the, uh, 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 the sickness of it. I liked the shame of it because I didn't like me. I liked the humiliation of it because I thought I was supposed to be humiliated. I still think that way. I just don't do that today because you have told me how I don't need to do that today. I live with that shame, so that's why I went to a seminary. Because I figured if I got a long black robe, and I got a couple titles, and I got a prayer book under my arm, and you call me father or reverend or something like that, that somehow I could hide what happened in that basement. I knew what I did, but I spent the rest of my life trying to keep you from knowing what I did. And the more I try to keep you from knowing what I did, the sicker I got. And the more I was driven to the more deeply bizarre, crazy insanity. So I went and did whatever was necessary. One is too many, a thousand, never enough of anything for me. That's how I got to be a diabetic. That's how I got two heart attacks. That's how I got heart surgery. One's too many, thousand, never enough. If it hurts you, I want more. If it'll destroy you, I want more. I'm interested. And so I went there to study to be a priest. I figured if I'm a priest, they'll never guess what I did in the basement. One day in the seminary, they said there were 400 people in the room. I was in the back. They said, we need somebody to go in the Maryland Penitentiary to work as an assistant chaplain three days a week. I'm in the back. I said, if I don't raise my hand, all 400 of these people will know that I was in the basement with three boys and I did something and I still got issues with my sexuality. So I got to raise my hand because I heard what they did in prison. And at the same time, as I was putting my hand up, I was hoping that something like that would happen to me when I got in the jail because I'm interested in that. And so I went there. What did I tell you? Here's how I used. Already I'm jammed up with sickness. I'm jammed up with guilt. I'm jammed up with shame. Already I don't like me. Already I won't look in your eye because I'm afraid you'll look in my eye and see who I really am. When I heard my name, it caused me to shrink away. All those years in school, I never did too good and I never did too bad. I did not want them to call my name. So I went. And on June 17th, 
1961, in the south wing of the Maryland Penitentiary, which was the segregation wing, second tier, which was death row at that time, there was a man who now is dead, may God rest him, in the first cell on the second tier, who used to stay naked, covered with feces, urine on the floor, with a rat for a pet, that if it squealed, he killed and caught another rat and made it his pet with a blanket to hide himself from the rest of humanity on the door of his cell. Stop me, they used to call me Deke. Stop me this day, say, Deke, if you want to feel as good as I do, use this. What is it, Rob? They call it cocaine. I did not know what cocaine was. I was naive. I did not know if it came out of cows or if it grew. I didn't know nothing about it. Him naked and stinking. You want to be as feel like I do, use this. Sam used it. <laughs> Sam was sick before cocaine went in his nostril. Sam never looked nobody in the eye. Sam always checked the board when he came in the penitentiary that said population. That day it said 857. I always used to walk. My job was second tier of the segregation wing, south wing, and then it was the prison hospital, which was on the other side of the yard. There was a metal shop and a wood shop and a kitchen in this yard. Sam always walked in the middle of the yard for fear somebody would come out with a, a shank of some kind and, and cause me some harm. So I always walked down the middle of the yard to be in clear view and never out of sight of people around the wall watching what went on in this yard. This day when he gave me that thing, I remember walking down that tier, looking every man on that tier square in the eye, saying, good afternoon. And if he didn't answer me, I think I said, good afternoon as I looked him in the eye. For the first time in my life, I could not fight. I only looked like I could and acted like I could, but I was always scared to death. This day, I remember walking down there thinking, they can come at me one at a time if they feel like it, or all 857 can come at one time. I'll be all right. I'm ready. For 29 years, I chased that feeling. I never felt it again. I went from one drug to another drug. I had no money, but I had a body. I sold me. I gave me up. Whatever you said was necessary for you to give me what I wanted, that's what I did. I learned early on. All you need to do is meet people who like you with big money. So I met undertakers, preachers, lawyers, and doctors who like to get high. And they like to get high with the priest because they thought there was something special about that. I remember the undertaker saying, Father Sam, bless the package, it'll be a blast. I remember thinking, if we get caught, I used to get high in the basement of the undertaking shop. Dead bodies everywhere. And I remember thinking of the police breaking this place. And they used to say to me, but if you're with us, we be all right. They won't mess with the priest. They liked some fascination, so I hung with them. I never bought a drug. I stayed high for 21 years, never bought a drug. Did insane things. In 1982, somebody gave me some angel dust in that undertaking shop. I did not know what it was. I do not know what it is. I do not intend to find out what it is. He said, we wrap this thing up, we mix this thing up with a little bit of weed. It'll give you the best high you ever had. I smoked that joint. Nowadays, they smoke these blunts. They like that. In my day, we had little joints you could hardly hold in your hand, right? Ain't nothing happened. 
He gave me this envelope of silver stuff. I carried it home and I smoked it by itself. I got so high, I did not know what happened to me. I tore my clothes off on the roof of the Miller Homes in Trenton, New Jersey, housing project. I could not, I thought that there were bugs in the air. Come, I was hallucinating. For six months, I stayed high. It would go away, and then it would come like the flu. I don't know what that stuff is. I don't know what's in it, but it would come like the flu, like a wave. I remember driving my car. We have circles, uh, uh, traffic circles in New Jersey. I remember getting on one in Trenton, New Jersey, going around 52 times because I didn't know how to get off. I remember go driving up the Jersey Turnpike four miles an hour. And the police stopped me. He said, sir, do you know you're going four miles an hour? I said, thank you, officer. Like I was something special, did something good. I got scared. I went to church. That happened in, that happened in August or July. At Christmas night, midnight, by now I'm a priest. I got ordained. I had to get high to get ordained because I was scared. They were all crying out of joy. Mother, grandmother, father, they all joyful crying. I'm in the bathroom smoking something to go in there because I knew I was going to hell. And I figured today I'm signing my death warrant, letting them do this to me. I got ordained, kept on lying, kept on running. Ordained to Trenton, New Jersey. Running to New York City, had spots, 14th Street, Harlem, knew where to go. Used to go in the middle of the night from Baltimore. When I got to Baltimore, 10.30 at night, get a train and go to Harlem. Go to New York City, 3 in the morning, white face, Roman collar, briefcase, Bible, $1,000 to bring back a package of heroin to heroin addicts, and I did not use heroin. So I'd be accepted by the addicts. I was sick and sicker and sick, got sicker and sicker and sicker. Anyway, I put down, at Christmas Eve, I sat there at the altar. They had two candles on the altar. They looked at me like they was four. They didn't look like they was six. They didn't look like they was eight. The organ sounded like it was getting louder and louder and louder. I remember jumping up in the church, running out the church, screaming, my heart, my heart, my heart. Ain't nothing wrong with my heart. It was the angel dust came back from the summertime. <laughs> so I got scared. I played around with other drugs for a while. June 17th, it was by mistake, June 17th. I didn't plan it, it was God. Same day as I picked up, I never realized until I came here, I never touched another chemical. But listen, y'all, I'm here to tell you this. That was 1982. I did not find y'all till 1990. I'm a living proof of how sick an addict can be who is clean and not in recovery. Every never, every not me, every shameful, despicable act that a human male could perform, I performed clean because I was an addict and I had no medicine to calm down my feeling when that beast jumped up inside me. What I discovered was I had a beast that lived inside me. I had an animal. I had a fierce, uh, a ferocious something living in my inner being that wanted me. What I didn't know was that I was sick. What I thought was I was dying. I didn't know what happened. I remember getting in. This is clean now going up to 14th Street, because the Jamaicans would stick me up. And I liked the feel of steel on my neck. And I liked the conversation that went on as I talked my way out of being shot. I liked being raped. I liked being uh, uh, manhandled. I liked being humiliated. I liked being hurt. I could not stop 
going up to get hurt. And the more they hurt me, the more I went back to get hurt some more because this beast was raging inside me and I had nothing to feed him, only my own self. And so I fed him every day and every day got worse than the next day. And I used to cry when I woke up in the morning. Why did I wake up? God, why did you let me die last night? I don't want to be here. I don't want to run again. And I had no drug in me. I got in an airplane and went to San Francisco because they said they had wild sex in San Francisco. And I paid a man $120 to tie me up, hang me off his ceiling naked, and stick things in me in places where stuff's only supposed to come out of, not go in. Electric prods and shocks and needles and pain and suffering paid the man to hurt me. Clean, clean, but not in recovery. I remember getting in airplanes and flying to Europe to find the ultimate thrill. I'm telling you, somebody who's really seriously very, very sick, running day after day after day and never finding what I was running. I didn't even know what I was running for. All I knew in 1982, I went to Nicaragua during the war, hoping I could get shot, and they would say I was a hero. I went to El Salvador, hoping I would get shot, so they would say I was a hero. I remember walking down Greenmount Avenue in Baltimore, Maryland, and those of you who don't know anything about that, it's a rough place. I was there for 22 years. I like ghettos. I like trouble. I like violence. I like all that. I had a Doberman pincer. He used to walk at my knee. His name was Czar. I used to wear a long army coat and a long black priest gown underneath that thing with hair tied in a long uh, uh, a ponytail in the back with wild hats on my head. Walk down Greenmount Avenue every night hoping some drug dealer would take me out of here with a pistol or a rifle and they put in the newspaper that the priest trying to help the addicts out went down like a hero. I tried to get somebody to kill me but would nobody kill me. I remember people sticking me up and me fucking with them so that they would hurt me and they wouldn't kill me and I didn't know what was wrong with me. I couldn't even die. I couldn't think about suicide. I was too scared. One day in this church I was at, somebody said, can we uh, have an NA meeting in the church? Oh, by the way, I used to run drug treatment programs. I worked for Daytop in New York and brought it to Trenton, New Jersey. I opened Excel in Baltimore Therapeutic Community. My theory was an addict is a heroin user who uses a needle to put stuff inside themselves. So Sam, you're not an addict. I don't drink and I never use heroin because I saw you use heroin and throw up. I saw you nod. I say, no, no, I got too many control issues. I don't nod. No, sir. I want a drug that's going to fire me up. I want something going to give me eyes behind my head. I want something going to let me run 48 hours straight, sleep for two and get back up for 24 more. I ain't sitting on no corner, nodding with puke coming out of my throat. No, sir. So I ran programs to get you better because you did that. I was better. So I had to smoke a joint in the morning and snort some cocaine in the evening because the addicts made me nervous and stressed my life out. I became such a professional liar. One thing I love about NA is you can't lie to y'all. If I lie, you know it immediately. But out there in the other world, I became a good liar. If I smoked three joints, I could preach for a half hour, jump out the pulpit, up and down the aisle, and put on a show. When I became a priest, once too many, a thousand, never enough, 
So I got three, four degrees, got a doctorate. They gave me a chair of theology to teach at Loyola College in Baltimore. He's put me in an airplane, sent me over to Tantour in Israel to teach every January for seven years, sit with the imams and the rabbis. I had a reputation. I wrote theology. I wrote all about God. I could pray in old Slavonic because I was raised in a Ukrainian church. I could pray in Latin. I could pray in Greek. I could read. I could sing. I knew the Bible in and out. I thought I was somebody. But you know what? I never saw God until I came in the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous. And I saw God in your faces. And in the addicts I was in basements with who got serenity and got peace. That's where I first met God. When I came in here, somebody taught me, you got to lay down all those rituals. This has got to be a God of your understanding, not somebody else's God. Put all that down. Stop your formal prayer. I learned how to pray, God, meet me today where I need you the most. I learned that I always asked for the wrong thing. I learned I was so sick, what I wanted was exactly what I did not need. So I had to learn. You taught me, addicts taught me, surrender to a God of your understanding. You don't need to know nothing about him. Just surrender. Say, here I am, please help me. By then I was desperate. I was living a double, triple life. I had three heart attacks. I remember laying on the gurney in the hospital that I was in charge of and them talking about me working myself to death. But me knowing that I was laying on that gurney because of those trips to New York City in the middle of the night, running constantly, leading a double life trying to find the thrill and getting up on Sunday morning and every other morning and pretending like I was a man of God and I wasn't a man of nothing, beginning with myself, never mind God. I was a liar, a professional liar. I didn't know a lie from the truth. I did not know fantasy from reality. I had lost all sense. I forgot how to feel. I forgot how to think. I forgot how to love. I forgot how to allow you to love me. I came in here and you taught me. You said, listen, Sam, you're no better and you're no worse than the rest of us. Why don't you just sit down and shut up and listen for a little while? Maybe we can teach you something. And I looked at your face and somebody one day handed me a pamphlet. It said, triangle of self-obsession. It said if, when you think about your past, what you feel is shame and guilt, and if, when you look at your present, you find out that your energy is anger, and it said if you think about the future and what you experience is immediate fear, then you are caught up in a triangle of self-obsession. You have a disease called obsessive compulsive addiction and you're going to die if you don't do something about it. What shall I do? What you shall do is sit down, humble yourself, or you will be humiliated. For all those years, I ran around the world arrogant, better than I remember coming into N.A. and you all brought court slips or whatever you call them here, I don't know. We call them court slips. And I remember thinking, damn, I'm better than, I ain't never been in no court. I ain't never been arrested. I'm better than them. They need this. Well, it's better than going to jail, so all right, have the meeting in the church. I remember them getting up and telling the story like I'm telling you my story tonight with all the sincerity and honesty that I can. And I remember thinking, damn, they must really be sick <laughs> to feel like they need to get up and embarrass themselves like that. Thank God I ain't never had to tell that shit about me to anybody. You know, I stopped using on my own eight years ago. I remember sitting there in my arrogance, but I came back. Today I understand it was the energy 
of this room, which is God's energy. See, what I understand today, why I'm humbled tonight is, I look out here, this is God. This is the energy and the love of God, as I understand God, passing from one to another, giving me strength to put words in my mouth. I ain't prepared nothing. I don't have nothing to prepare. I don't have nothing to give you, only my story, only my experiences, my strengths, and my hopes. That's all I got. And so I come here, and your energy and your love shoots out from down there up here, and it does something inside me. I don't even know where the words come from. I don't know how to put them together, but God does this thing. That's what I know. And I sat there, and I listened. And one day it snowed and it was icy. And there was only six people in the meeting, so they turned it into a round robin. Our meetings are always speaker meetings. And somebody, another addict said, I passed this thing to Father Sam. I had been coming for a year. I sat in the back. I never said nothing. I was scared. By then I knew I was an addict. By then I knew I had a disease. I just wished I could have the courage to admit I had the disease so I could beg somebody, please help me, please. Those heart attacks, the heart surgery, all that lie, all that shame, all that misery, every day getting up, no drug now, looking people in the eye who depended on me to tell them the truth and I couldn't tell myself the truth. This night in the ice and snow, he said, I pass it to Father Sam. I remember thinking, I should say, my name is Sam, and I'm a grateful recovering human being because I heard people say that. I didn't want to put that word on my name. I knew what I should say, but I was scared to say it. And I remember that night, they talk about a spiritual awakening. I had prepared by sitting down and listening. This night, God, came over my spirit. Somehow inside, I remember opening my mouth. And before I knew it, I remember saying, I am an addict. My name is Sam. And the minute I said it, a burden came off my shoulder. I began to be opened up to learn something about the disease. They told me, take these 12 steps and learn how to live with yourself. Take these 12 steps, admit who you really are. Say it, put it on your lips. Look at your unmanageability. Come to believe you think you're the professional religionist and you ain't never ever honestly look God in the eye of your spirit. You've been afraid to look inside. Come to believe there's a power greater than you and that power can restore you to sanity. They said to me, make a decision. You don't have to do it. Just decide to turn your life and your will over. God, please help me. Write that shit down so that you have to own it and you can't deny it. Go share it with somebody. Tell it to God. Tell it to you. Tell it to another other human being. Beg God. Get ready to beg God to pick up your defects of character. I like my character defects. I had a hard time with that. I like to lie. I like to steal. I like to manipulate. I like to blame you. I thought if I ever give up my defects, maybe I'll get in trouble. I used to steal. I made $40,000 a year, and I would steal newspapers on Sunday afternoon from the coffee shop just to prove it could be done. I like to do that. I like to go into the Rite Aid drugstore and steal stuff by taking it out of the box that had the little uh, barcode on that the thing would ring and put it in my pocket and give it to somebody or throw it away. I just like to steal, that's all. That's all. I just like to manipulate people. But I got ready and I asked God and God removed that and I made a list and I made amends. And I began to practice the 10th step. 
I began to not let this thing build up anymore. I began to tell you exactly what I felt. I began to tell you exactly what I was experiencing, what I was afraid of. I began to tell you the details of my secrets. I began to, to tell you that I ain't what I claim to be. I ain't nothing but an addict who's doing his best to stay alive. And please help me today if you have any information for me. I learned how to improve this conscious contact with God through honest prayer and meditation. And I learned when they called me up to come share my story to go do that because God's been good to me and because something has happened inside my spirit. Listen, Southern California, I love this place and I ain't never been here. I love, I've been in Los Angeles one time. I love this place because here you allowed the seed of Narcotics Anonymous to be planted. And here you nurtured it. Where I come from, I got probably as much clean time as anybody in the city of Baltimore. But I come here and I meet predecessors. Been here 40 and 35 and 30 years. You allowed that seed to grow in the soil of your home place. Thank you. Thank you a million times. Thank you, because they tried to plant it elsewhere and it could not grow. But here it has grown, and so I'm humbled and honored to be here. But also, God has led me to share with you this tonight. Please, Southern California, don't think you own this program. It is not yours. This thing belongs to God. And I'm telling you, please work at keeping this thing alive. Do not let racism, do not let sexism, do not let suburbanism or ghettoism or any other ism, do not let anything, do not let any weed grow in God's garden. God gave you this seed. You have done beautiful in keeping it alive these 50 years because you stayed here while I ran for 29 years. There was a room, a door was open. There was somebody with information to rescue this miserable, shame-filled, disgraced, pathetic individual out of the filth and the dirt and get washed clean and stand in nobility and in strength tonight. This is God's program. Please take care of it. Please keep the door open so that every addict in the world, no matter what, I'm going to sit down with this thought. As long as the ties that bind us together are stronger than those that can tear us apart, all will be well. Thanks for letting me share. God bless you.